about one step ahead of myself. Second Kings chapter five and in verse 11, we have Naaman. Naaman is a man who came with expectations. He heard there's a prophet in Israel who can cure his leprosy. He comes with certain expectations to Israel. And look at what, what he says in 2 Kings 5, verse 11. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. What, did, what, did, what was Naaman told to do? You see, the thing is, the thing is, the prophet the prophet never even came out. He sent his servant out. Man, Naaman's disappointed. There's a lack of what he expected here. He says, aren't there rivers in my own country? Paraphrasing. Aren't there rivers in my own country just as good as the Jordan River? Can I wash them and be clean? He says, are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. See, Naaman had an unfulfilled expectations. Thankfully, if you read the rest of the account, he has a servant that manages to convince him of common sense and he's cured of his leprosy. Unexpect or unfulfilled expectations or frustration sometimes is rooted in embarrassment. And this is this is where I want to introduce to you David and a wife that he loved, but also a wife that had certain expectations about what she wanted her husband to be as king. In 1 Chronicles chapter 15, and in verse 29, 1 Chronicles 15 verse 29, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David, Notice what she saw. Dancing in celebration. And she despised him in her heart. Why was he celebrating? I think of Danny. You know, Danny's always happy. He's always celebrating. He's always, woo. You need a, you need a pick her up or have Danny out on around. Okay? I see David as that kind of a person. David is celebrating. The ark of God is coming home. He's excited. He doesn't keep his emotions bottled up. David's the kind of guy, it's all out there open to see. And his wife is embarrassed that he is out here in front of the ark of God singing and dancing, celebrating. Her expectations are not met. And the Bible says she despised her husband. And you can see a ruined marriage. A desire or a wish is a request. And when we don't get what we hope for, we are disappointed. And anger can sometimes be the result. When you have a demand, think of this. Your expectations are almost a demand. When you expect something, whether it's from someone else or whether it's from God, when you expect something, it's almost Almost a demand. So maybe we need to turn that over to God. Our expectations should be what God expects of us. Sometimes we have expectations of what life is going to bring. Friends, <laughs> life has a way of changing things. When I was young, I had expectations of what life would be like and what having a family would be like. 
And I'm not saying that it's all bad and disappointment. It's just simply not what I expected. In Psalm 37, I want us to look here at uh, verse 4. The psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of his heart. That doesn't say when we delight in God, our desire is to delight in God's ways and God's paths. It is not to desire for ourselves. Back up a chapter in Psalm 36, verse 5, the psalmist says, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like a mountain of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. And you give them to drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you. And to your, right, and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me. Nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There are evildoers lie there the light there the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. See when our expectations are God's expectations, we need not fear disappointment. And the third is insecurity. It's an attack on our self worth or who we are. Insecurity, sometimes we may not view ourselves as insecure until someone makes a personal attack on who we are. Proverbs 18, verse 19 says, Proverbs 18, 19, A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the boars of a castle. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen pigs quarrel, fight. Well, that's a loud, obnoxious scene. But yet, Solomon says, hmm, that could happen to brothers when we are attacked in our self-worth. We'll go very quickly here because time is way over past. I've way overshot my normal time. And I was afraid I would. But let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 18. And I do apologize for the time. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And I don't have the particular verse here. I want to give you an overview of what's going on. 1 Samuel chapter 18. We see again David. And Saul. And in this chapter, David is very popular. David, as Saul comes up to the city, it says in verse 6, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. Oh dear. Here Saul has a problem. His self-value is under attack. And Saul was very angry at this saying. Displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David 10,000, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. What a horrible thing. And yet Saul feels insecure. And it manifests itself in anger. In Acts chapter 5, and I'm not going to go back there, but the Jewish leaders of Acts chapter 5 and verse 12 feel threatened because Christianity is becoming popular. The disciples are making converts. They're spreading the gospel and they become 
angry and they lash out. Why do you think we have persecution in the church throughout the New Testament? Because the Jewish leaders were insecure and they felt threatened. Whose approval are we seeking to begin with? God's approval is the only approval that we need. We don't need to prove our self-worth to the world. We don't even need to prove our self-worth to ourselves. Saying that is easier than applying it. But Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and in verse 21, Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. Solomon says, don't take it to heart when he criticizes you because you know deep down in from time to time you criticize others. In closing, if we can find the underlying emotion, whether it's hurt or one of the other emotions, I met expectations, attack on our self-worth, if we can identify the underlying emotion that is triggering anger, then we can work on those areas and avoid placing ourselves in positions where we lose control. But also understand, as Kate said, sometimes the root of our anger might be out of our control, so that we have to deal with the root cause, so that we have to deal with the root cause in a different way through one form of anger or another. Yet when we become angry, remember what Paul says, be angry and do not sin. We'll close today by reminding you that Jesus is the answer. Jesus has a way of changing the heart, taking what we have and working with it, turn it over to God. Bottom line, turn it over to God. If there's anyone here who's subject to the invitation, I want you to make your wants and wishes known as together we stand and as we sing.